Welcome to part two to the Cognitive Theories Lecture. In part one, we discussed schemas, we talked about their impact on working memory, and we also talked about the limitations of working memory. Initial cognitive studies put the limitations of working memory at about seven items. Seven items could be held in working memory at one time. But recently, studies have proved that that number is even smaller, that only up to four items can be held in working memory at one time. Let's take a look at an experiment that looks at the limitations of working memory. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it, but did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. When working memory is asked to focus on many different specific objectives or elements, it can be taxed to capacity, causing us to miss things. This is cognitive overload, and it's another indicator of just how limited working memory can be. When working memory is asked to focus on so many things at once, how do we help our learners manage the cognitive bottleneck? Well, maybe this will help. Let's take a look at a model of how working memory and cognitive load factor in how people learn, how they learn from multimedia. We'll pretend that this represents a lesson. And the lesson may contain pictures and words in printed or spoken form. The pictures and printed words enter the learner's cognitive processing system through the eyes. Spoken words, they enter through the ears. And all of this gets processed in the sensory memory. Now, if your learner is paying attention, some of the material is selected for further processing in his working memory. This is where schemas impact organization and perception of new information. And this is where your learner can hold or manipulate just a few pieces of information at a time in each channel. In working memory, your learner can mentally organize some of these selected images into a visual model and some of these selected words into a verbal model. It's at this point that your learner can then integrate the new incoming material with prior knowledge from long-term memory. The three important cognitive processes that we see demonstrated here is first selecting, selecting words 
and images. Paying attention to relevant words and images in the material. Next is organizing, mentally organizing the selected relevant words and images. And at the end of the process is integration. It's integrating the incoming verbal and visual representations with each other and with existing prior knowledge. The successful engagement of all of these processes results in meaningful learning. Question is, how can we contribute to the successful processing as we design? The best thing is to avoid the cognitive overload. Design your instruction in a way as not to overload the mind's capacity for processing that information. Ask yourself, does what I design support or distract from learning? Is there balance? Am I keeping it interesting and focused on the concepts to be learned? Or is it too entertaining? Because working memory can be overloaded by the entertainment before the learner ever gets to the concepts to be learned. And finally, did I take my learner's prior knowledge into account so he or she may obtain the educational objective? What you're really striving for is less is more. Although less is more, multimedia instruction should not strive to teach with the least amount of cognitive load possible, but at a level that is appropriately tailored to the prior knowledge of your learner. Well, this concludes part two in this lecture series. Once you take this opportunity to take a little break, maybe stretch your legs a little bit. And when we look at part three, we'll take a closer look at the cognitive theories that impact multimedia design.